big key word in the entire <clears throat> debate between evolutionary biology and creationism is transitional form. Most of us who understand science have good general ideas about how this term can be defined and can even bring up good examples of them, but there's still some ambiguity to be addressed in order to highlight the typical creationist ignorance and or sheer denial of transitionals that indeed exist, in addition to also highlighting how the kinds argument is just a poorly thought out cop out. After defining all of the pertinent terms, I'll show you how you yourself can determine whether something is a transitional form through the taxonomic classification method known as cladistics. Once you know how to use cladistics, you'll be able to show with reasonable certainty not only that most if not all living things on earth can have a conceivable common ancestor at every level, but also how the phenomenon of evolution can be accurately described in the broadest sense. Gilbert, you crap scallion! Why aren't you in school? I couldn't get past the protesters. A bunch of smiling, angry people were handing out these anti-evolution flyers. Ugh. Evolution is under attack in our schools? To the science mobile! I don't understand evolution, and I have to protect my kids from understanding it. We will not give in to the thinkers! You people are as loud as you are ignorant. To begin, we must really determine what a transitional form is meant to describe. The term transitional form is often used synonymously with the term missing link, usually on both sides of the debate, but this is a bit erroneous. It's a subtle difference, but once you know how the two terms come to be, the differences become clear. At the time when Darwin first published his landmark work, many scientists had different ideas about how important natural selection was as a factor of the evolution of living things. One of the prevailing pre-modern theories of evolution was the idea of orthogenesis. Orthogenesis was the hypothesis that living things had some kind of innate drive to evolve into new species, as opposed to species evolving as a result of short-sighted natural selection. Orthogenesis is summed up pretty well in the most popular image of evolution in the internet, the March of Progress, where we see that there is a strict, linear progression of some primitive primate form evolving into the human primate form. This progression was made of more primitive species evolving directly into more advanced species, linked together by intermediates. So in the search of finding these intermediate species in the fossil record, those that haven't been found yet were called the missing links, thus the term was coined. Oh! If your elitist East Coast evolution is real, why has no one found the missing link between modern humans and ancient apes? We did find it! It's called Homo erectus! Then you have proven my case, sir! For no one has found the link between apes and this Homo erectus! Yes, they have! It's called Homo habilis! Aha! But no one has found the missing link between ape and the so-called Homo habilis. Yes, they have! It's called Australopithecus africanus! Ho oh, ho! I've got you now! It wasn't until both the fossil record and the field of genetics were fully fleshed out with better understanding and technology that the term missing link started losing its value. Because it became more and more clear that species weren't evolving in some linear fashion. Instead, species changed in proportional to how drastic their environment changed. Evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould explains why these data were so puzzling. Problem was that evolution was defined by most paleontologists, at least in terms of what you might see in the fossil record, as finding a series of fossils arranged in a time sequence, that is up a hillside, for example, through a set of sediments, where you would get imperceptibly gradual change little by little that you'd find a brachiopod or a clam or some kind of animal in the oldest rocks and then as you went to younger and younger rocks they'd get a little bit bigger or a little bit ribbier gradually and imperceptibly tiny bit by a tiny bit in each younger rock paleontologists also knew that you never found that or hardly ever found it in fact what you'd usually find in the fossil record is uh, one form that was pretty stable and it would have a range <clears throat> that often existed for millions of years and then you'd get another form that you could say was its descendant that had evolved from it and it would be different and it would be different immediately when you first found it and its difference from its ancestor wouldn't increase it would also be stable up the sequence of rocks these observations led to the understanding that natural selection indeed plays a large role in how populations change and when phylogenetic trees were able to be mapped out with genetic data, scientists were now able to illustrate that evolution gave a more bushy or tree-like ancestry rather than the linear ancestry that orthogenesis proposed. Where instead of one population giving rise to strictly one more advanced form, 
it was shown that one population can give rise to two or more different populations at any point in time, and natural selection filtered out the ones least adapted to survive in their new environments. With this new understanding, scientists realized that there are no distinct links to be found. Rather, there is a much slighter gradient of forms appearing when environments were stable, and more drastic changes when environments changed. And this idea was coined as punctuated equilibrium. Working together, Eldridge and Gould called their new pattern punctuated equilibria. Punctuated equilibria refers to this pattern that we have uh, of tremendous stability, of non-change of species once they first appear. They tend to go on with these invertebrates for 5 or 10, even 15 million years without showing much evolutionary change. That's the equilibrium part of it. And when you do get evolutionary change, it tends to be concentrated in these splitting events when one species will, will diverge off from another. And that will happen perhaps in five or 50,000 or even 100,000 years of time. It doesn't take a great deal of time for that divergence to happen. So that's the punctuation. Without a clear criterion for which species are links and which species are just variations of the same species, the term transitional form was coined in place of missing link. Herein lies the distinction between missing link and transitional form. The former is a throwback to a time when it was thought that species evolved in a linear progression regardless of how their environments changed, while the latter acknowledges that evolution is a fluctuating progress of change, where at any point in time, one species may give rise to two or more species if their environments change drastically enough. Yes, this distinction is a little nuanced, but it's important to know what we're talking about when we try to find these intermediates between older populations and newer ones. With that distinction made, to make things a little bit more complicated, there are actually two types of transitional forms that arise, and they differ depending on the type of relationship they actually show. The first type is the ancestral transitional, where an ancestor directly gives rise to a descendant, which then directly gives rise to another descendant. Think of a grandfather to father to son as an analogy, where father is the ancestral transitional form between grandfather and son. This seems pretty straightforward, but since we know that evolution more often gives a more bushy ancestor than a linear one, it becomes increasingly difficult to know definitively which specific species gave rise to which, as the taxonomic groups grow larger and larger. So to compensate for this uncertainty, the second type of transitional form is used instead, which goes more like grandfather's cousin, to father's cousins, to son's cousins. In other words, the species we use by the second definition of transitional form can be considered early divergent species rather than direct ancestors. The reason we can call these species transitionals despite not likely being ancestral is because not only are they easier to justify as such than as direct ancestors, which requires DNA evidence to really show, but also because they still fulfill the purpose that both types of transitionals are meant to fulfill, which is to display the general trend of evolutionary change that led to each species involved. These divergent species, or cladistic transitionals as I call them, can serve as evolutionary road signs that tell us what traits each species following the intermediates ought to have thus illustrating an evolutionary phylogeny. We can consider them as such road signs because if a creature falls into a similar time frame in addition to a similar ecological niche as a direct ancestor would probably have, they can indeed be thought to be representative of the population that the direct ancestor would have been a part of. I promise this will make more sense in a minute. So I call this second type of transitional as cladistic transitionals after the methodology with which we find these transitionals, cladistics. The heart of cladistics is about making hypotheses of evolutionary relationships based on select character traits being compiled or modified over time, and these hypotheses are then weighed against the evidence in the fossil record and sometimes the DNA of living species, among others. Those which are the simplest and most supported are considered the most likely scenarios through which evolutionary change occurred. And all intermediate species considered in any one cladistic lineage, also known as a cladogram, are thus called cladistic transitionals, and to find them, you just need to know the most general definition I can come up with. If we define taxonomic group A as a set of creatures that harbor some trait A, and if we also define taxonomic group C as a set of creatures that harbor traits A, B, and C, then a cladistic transitional is any creature in the taxonomic group B that harbors traits A and B, but not traits C. One should immediately notice the pattern of a nested hierarchy, which should appear in any biological classification scheme since, as we've established, evolution is known to be bushy in nature, not linear. And once we place all of the relevant creatures into their proper positions, this nested hierarchy can be directly translated to a cladogram. And once supporting evidence like genetic similarity and extra fossil forms are incorporated, we can say that the prevailing hypotheses made through this method are quite robust. So with this definition of the cladistic method, let's run through some examples so you can see how to apply it and find some transitionals yourself to show creationists when they demand some.
Suppose we wanted to find out how land tetrapods came about using cladistics. To do so, we can go through the general cladistic definition and simply replace each variable with the creatures that fit the criteria of traits that we set. We know that tetrapods are chordates with calcified bones that have a lobe limb skeleton design, lungs for respiration, and four developed limbs with which they use to support their own body weight. These features can be our traits A, B, and C, respectively, where tetrapoda is taxon C. We can use any creature within tetrapoda to represent it, but let's just use a salamander. Taxon A is thus defined as chordates with calcified bones and a lobe limb skeletal design. This taxon is called Sarcopterygii, and since this is taxon A, and we're trying to find the transition between taxon A and C, it ought to be represented by some creature that has trait A, yet doesn't have lungs nor well-developed limbs. The living coelacanth subclass of fish, Actinistia, fit this criterion quite well, so we can use them as representatives. Thus, we come to our testable definition for a transition, taxon B, that should fall between water-dwelling Tarcopterygians and the land-dwelling tetrapods. The definition follows as, accorded with the calcified low limb skeletal structure and lungs, but does not have the limb structure necessary to walk like true tetrapods. Lo and behold, there are actually a few creatures that we know of that fit this definition, usually within the lungfish taxon. We can see that most lungfish species rely on their lungs to respire, yet they're all relegated to the marine environment, lacking the limbs necessary to carry their own weight on land. The lungfish thus gives our evolutionary hypothesis that tetrapods are derived from pre-tetrapod Sarcryptorygians some valid standing. But why stop there? If we understand that evolution is an ongoing process, then there should be even more transitionals we can find either before the lungfish appeared or afterwards before true tetrapods appear. And the fossil record indeed yields these mid-transitionals, oodles of them tracing virtually the entire transition from Sarcopterygian fish to amphibious tetrapods. With such a transition so well established with ample evidence, as we've also established earlier, it's therefore quite likely that this reconstruction of evolutionary change is indeed accurate. And when we translate this nested hierarchy into a cladogram, we can show that all creatures in the tetrapod group are certainly likely to be descended from Sarcopterygian fish. Remember that cladistic analysis doesn't tell us that the end group of species are direct descendants of cladistic transitionals. Rather, it tells us that the terminal group is likely to be just one end group that developed from the evolutionary trend outlined by all of the cladistic transitionals we find through our analysis. Let's try another example, one a little closer to home. Suppose I wanted to find some transitional between humans and other apes in the Hominini tribe. We can define Hominini as taxon A, and trait A can be defined as terrestrial apes with a more slender chest cavity than gorillas. Humans and chimps clearly fit here, but what makes humans unique from the chimps? Well, we can define taxon C as homo, and assign traits B and C as obligate bipedalism with an adducted hallux and tall stature, respectively. So we know if a cladistic transitional exists, or have existed, it ought to have chip-like proportions, yet is obligately bipedal with adducted hallucis, like humans. Hmm, I wish such a creature would appear for me to use an image. Oh wait, there she is. In case you're wondering, we can tell that Australopithecus was bipedal because of two things. The hole through which the vertebral column attaches is closer to the bottom position in humans than to the backwards position in chimpanzees, which are quadrupedal. And the pelvis is closer in proportion to ours than to chimpanzees. And Australopithecus isn't the only transitional we can consider. We can also consider Ardipithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo hydrobergensis that all indicate a seamless evolutionary trend showing less chip-like features in favor of more human-like features. It should also be noticeable that the more transitionals we can deduce to exist, the easier it is to infer direct ancestral transitionals because the closer we get to the target species, the more narrow the trait criteria becomes, reducing the amount of potential ancestral species that may have existed. While cladistics is certainly a compelling taxonomic method to create models of evolutionary ancestry, it's important to realize that, like every other scientific methodology, every hypothesis ought to be falsifiable and based only on the evidence that can be verified. Subjective trait criteria like souls and other supernatural ideas are not considered, simply because they can't be verified to exist outside of one's own mind. This is why physical morphology tends to be the main harbinger of trait criteria, especially when it comes to extinct species when morphology is all we have of them with some exceptions in human evolution when early humans started creating sophisticated stone tools, alluding to social behavior that might be used as a trait criterion. DNA evidence becomes important here, however, because sometimes it does become a bit ambiguous to tell between morphological traits that are converging and which is inherited from a common ancestor. This is where the vast majority of taxonomic controversy exists. Sometimes they can be alleviated with DNA evidence, but not if the controversy surrounds just extinct creatures, in which case only new and more complete fossils would settle. Because morphology is most of what cladists work with when considering extinct species, 
The conclusions they make are often tested with parsimony, which means that these hypotheses must make the least amount of unverifiable assumptions as possible, so they can get to the most likely conclusion possible. And in this quest of keeping things simple, the ideal amount of fossil and DNA evidence ought to show support for only one cladistic model of evolutionary development. Therefore, if any large magnitude of the verifiable evidence were to show support for two or more contradictory cladistic models of evolutionary ancestry, then we would know that cladistics is not reliable. In other words, if evidence were to appear that confounded the best hypotheses for evolutionary trends and transitions, all cladistic models involved in those transitions would be falsified. The evidence necessary to disprove such currently robust models would have to include contradictory geological footprints between hypothesized parent and daughter clades. In other words, we should be finding index fossils in the wrong places, like dinosaurs with Devonian stem tetrapods, which would mean that diapsids had to have appeared before their first true tetrapods, Australopithecus remains with Dimetrodon remains, which would mean that mammals could not have been descended from Phenacodontids, or modern birds with Triassic pterosaurs, which would mean that birds would not actually be descended from dinosaurs. Falsifying cladistics can also be done by finding creatures that have well-developed structural traits that lack any precedence in earlier species whatsoever. These don't just include chimeras and other mythological creatures, but it would also include mammals with fully developed feathers, lizards, turtles, dinosaurs, and other diapsids with mammary glands, any land corded without jaws or with cartilaginous bones, or any other creature that confounds the current cladistic classifications based on the nested hierarchies of shared versus derived physical and genetic traits backed by the transitionals we find in the fossil record. A final way that cladistics can be falsified as a reliable method of reconstructing evolutionary trends would be to legitimately show that complex organisms can be spontaneously generated by a creator or otherwise, as opposed to being biogenetically derived from earlier populations. This is the creationist burden, because if creationists want to accept that cladistics is reliable at any point in the nested hierarchy of life, they then have to show and support the boundary beyond which any creature could not have possibly been derived from an earlier predecessor. Any legitimate evidence brought forth, like the examples I've just mentioned, would not only pose problems for the cladistic method of classification, but they would also actually offer credence for the idea that there indeed were separately involved kinds of creatures that could not have been derived from some common template that cladistics is meant to find. However, until such evidence is brought forth, the kinds idea can't be considered anything more than conjecture, because cladistics itself can show with reasonable certainty how the physical characteristics of most, if not all, forms of life come about as a function of appearing from a common template. Since all forms of earthly life can be reliably placed in a unifying tree of ancestry, it validates the ultimate prediction that evolutionary theory can offer, that life is continuous and ever-changing, not discontinuous and limited as asserted by creationists. Cladistics is obviously a very reliable method for reconstructing the life history of earthly species, and after showing you, my viewer, how to perform simple cladistic analyses, it should become clear what the problem is in the creationist term, kinds. Because since the term cannot be strictly defined and verified to be valuable in describing groups, unlike all actual taxonomic ranks and clades, it is thus useless in both proposing and refuting evolutionary hypotheses. In other words, it's a very predictable cop-out in the most basic way, like an argumentative emergency button to avoid the cognitive dissonance caused by an unfortunate critical analysis of the similarities that do so obviously exist throughout life. Of course, this appeals to people who don't want to think too much, who don't feel like going through the effort of actually studying the recent scientific material, understanding the necessary methods, experiments, and concepts, making reasonable inferences, and taking note of all legitimate evidence available to them. So to summarize, from this first part of cladistics made easy, you now know the distinction between the missing link and a transitional form, because of their implied ideas about how evolution works. You also know the distinction between the two types of transitional forms, and why certainty of direct ancestry tends to decrease as more taxonomic groups are compiled together. You now know how to come up with cladistic hypotheses and how to test them against the hard evidence of extinct forms we find in the fossil record and DNA similarity in living species. So you're now armed with the beginner's tools for easily applying taxonomy to the evolutionary phenomenon. Science is indeed hard, especially in the natural sciences, because it requires a large investment of proper time and effort to understand the processes that happen around us and make testable predictions based on what we understand now or what we discover in the future. Cladistics is no exception to this, where the specific branches of the tree of life are continually reworked as genetic paleontological data continues to develop. Creationists don't care for this, choosing instead to go with the most unnecessarily simplistic answer of, they didn't, for the necessarily complicated question, how did these organisms evolve?